A wise man once told me, the only thing we know about the Second World War is that we know very little about the Second World War. So for many, here's a reminder, and for some, the first look at a forgotten part of that war. Our story starts on the 14th of June, 1940, when the German army marched into Paris. Hitler's next target was Britain itself. Snuggled in the English Channel are four large islands, Jersey, Guernsey, Alderney and Sark, and some smaller ones, which were, by the mistakes of geography and politics, British, and they were the next target for Hitler. Sixteen days after they took Paris, the Germans occupied British territory, the Channel Islands. I will read the orders. One, the island will be occupied by the armed forces of the German Reich forthwith. All islanders must be indoors between nine at night and six in the morning. No boat or vessel may leave any harbour or any other place. No one is allowed to go near the sea or down to the bays except in the vicinity of the harbour. All firearms and all radio receiving sets must be surrendered immediately. Evening news, evening news, German forces on British soil. There is no question that the Fuhrer was always worried that the British would like their islands back, if only for the propaganda value. Nor did he underestimate the propaganda value of German troops filmed cheerfully mingling with British citizens. Hitler was immensely proud of his only British conquest, and he was determined that this latest part of the Reich should not be recaptured. He argued that the islands had strategic importance and that they were his laboratory for Anglo-German relations. How relevant is it today? Do people still talk about it? Yes, they do. I think across the Channel Islands, people still feel that sense of history bearing down upon their shoulders. There are still people around today, albeit they were children at the time, who lived through the occupation and remember their parents and their grandparents talking about the, the deprivation under which they lived, but also being aware that the Germans were at the end of the street or would come into the house. And you know, we've all seen the pictures. They're, they are here, part of our everyday life of you know, people standing alongside German officers, these you know, Nazis in the streets of the British Isles. Yeah, let's, let's just separate that because it seems to me that it wasn't so much the Nazis who came to Jersey, but the German army. And that was a big difference, wasn't there, between the occupation of Europe and the occupation of the islands, right? People are very careful about the terminology they use because they do talk about the German occupation rather than the Nazi occupation, because the soldiers who came here were professionals. Hitler, for whatever reason, wanted to try to establish his foothold in the British Isles in these islands as what he used to call a, a model occupation. And very early on, when the um, surrender was given to these islands in, in July 1940, uh, the feeling was that as long as the islanders followed the laws that they were asked to live under, and you know they drove on the right-hand side of the road and they learned German in school, then they would be allowed to go about their lives pretty much unchanged, albeit cut off from the rest of the United Kingdom. And I think that's significant because the Germans wanted this to work because they wanted to show a way in which they could rule Europe that wasn't going to be as threatening as the Allies wanted to project it as. You used a word there which was surrender. Um, 
the, the, the British authorities basically withdrew, didn't they? Did, did the islanders feel let down and abandoned? Yes, they do. And to this day, you know, even we're talking two generations on, people are very quick to say, hang on a minute, London, hang on a minute, United Kingdom. You know, we are British Isles, we are crown dependencies, we are our allegiance here to Her Majesty the Queen, and that's the only reason we're linked to the United Kingdom. Uh, and you let us down in our hour of need. And, and the irony is, you know, when you look around the world today and what's happening in, in the global sphere, we rely upon the United Kingdom for our defence, but we don't have a lot of confidence in their ability to deliver it, I think it would be fair to say. You, you have the British authorities leaving. The Jersey people, that, that, what do we call them, Channel, Channel Islanders, on their own. So they've got to figure out, haven't they, do we cooperate with the Germans or do we... Uh, uh, do we have uh, some sort of resistance? I think there was a pragmatism that prevailed. I think that would be fair to say, rather than collaboration. Although, of course, later on, collaboration was very evident and the, the jury is still out on that. But effectively, the Channel Islands were left high and dry by London. And, you know, although Churchill lauded in his ability to be a great war leader, the Channel Islands weren't on his game plan. He realised that they were indefensible. They, he couldn't defend them without... Um, you know, putting in a vast amount of troops on the ground or having air supremacy that couldn't be maintained. And why, so did Hitler, why did Hitler want them then? Because he wanted to get his feet on British territory. It was a propaganda coup. And I think Hitler wanted them for that reason and to show that he could occupy a country in a way that the country could still operate, but he would be very much in control. So it was seen as a model occupation by the, the Nazi regime. Although, of course, just as we're seeing in contemporary news today, it's one thing to want to subjugate a people. It's another thing to actually have those people subjugated. Uh, was the Alderney uh, attack on the harbour real, the one that's in one of the movies where they, they, they attacked Alderney? Was it, oh, no, no, uh, yeah. no, not Alderney, Guernsey. Guernsey, yes, both Guernsey and so St. Peterport in Guernsey and St. Helier Harbour in Jersey were both attacked because nobody had told the Germans, and clearly their German um, intelligence wasn't up to it, that we had demilitarized. The British had withdrawn all armaments and all armored personnel from the islands. So effectively, the islands were sitting targets. And there are, were trucks containing potatoes and tomatoes, which are, you know, the staples of these islands, even to this day, and they were lined up on the harbour. And I think German reconnaissance planes thought they were military trucks. And so they strafed them and they bombed them and people died in both islands ahead of the occupation. And I think the Germans thought they were trying to soften up the targets when they didn't need to. Uh, this is part of Britain, Hans. The only part we have so far. The Fuhrer says we must win their confidence. The Fuhrer does not permit insults, and he is never soft with our enemies. So it was a very quiet kind of resistance, was it? I think so. Well, there was no opportunity to fight back because effectively the, um, the islands were demilitarised. All um, UK personnel were withdrawn. The lieutenant governors, the king's representatives in the island, were called back to London. And our appointed judicial leader, the bailiff, because we are bailiwicks, in other words, islands led by bailiffs, um, they took control, effectively ran the island and, and took control of all levers of power. And they had no option but to say, the Germans are coming, we can't defend ourselves. So they ordered people to fly white flags, they painted a big white cross in the main square in St Helier, and they surrendered and the bailiff drove up to the airport just as the commandant of the uh, occupying forces flew in and handed over because he realized that any other way of doing it would just have meant bloodshed and, and bloodshed that was never going to bring any kind of resolution. The people would have been obliterated. Mr. Kluger, I am not working with you to put away people like Martel. Mendoza, yes, I'll give him to you any day with pleasure. Martel, no, I'm not gonna be that kind of collaborator, Oberleutnant. And if you don't like that, you can bloody well lock me up. But it has to be said that, the, in general, the occupation of the Channel Islands was nowhere near as onerous as the occupation in the other countries like Belgium and France and Holland. Von Schmettau, wonderful uh, military commander. I have a signed photograph from him. 
uh, uh, said at one point in 1944 to the island, he said, you do not know what occupation is about. You do not know what bombing is about. You do not know what real starvation is. They do on mainland Europe, but you don't, not here. And that is by and large true. It was a gentle occupation in many kinds of ways. And it was gentle in, for an interesting reason. There were no Nazis as such there. They were all Wehrmacht boys, uh, German army boys. And particularly von Schmettau and another man, uh, von Aufsess, who was a civil administrator over there. Very intelligent, lovely men indeed, did their best to intercede between Berlin and the Channel Islands to save, in many cases, save the islanders' lives. They didn't always succeed because when an order came direct from Berlin, from Hitler, of course, there was no way of disobeying it. But everything they could to protect the islanders from the full force of a Nazi occupation, they did. I have come to say goodbye. Goodbye? Yes, I have been recalled to travel now. Oh, I'm sorry. I shall miss you. Oh, well. Isn't life extraordinary? Fancy me saying that to you. An English woman and a German colonel in the midst of a war. But it's the truth. I see it too. So you retired? No. I have been dismissed. Dismissed? Why? I have got satisfied my masters in Berlin. In what way? Why oh, should I bore you? No, with no, my no, 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 I'm interested. I wish to do my duty. But at the same time, I cannot bring myself to do all the things that are expected of me. That is why I am dismissed. Well, what will you do when you get home? Hope to survive. When Hitler decides he's going to go for Russia, he, he kind of forgets about the Channel Islands, doesn't he? He just leaves them on their own to, they're kind of just part of a, uh, an Atlantic wall. And he, he concentrates on Russia. Does that mean that it got, life got easier for people in, in the Channel Islands? Life got worse. Life got worse. And the terrible thing is, you know, if we're talking about humanity, it got worse for the occupying forces as well. Um, the commandant who originally uh, took control of the Channel Islands, and bear in mind there were different German leaders in, in Guernsey and in Sark, and Alderney is a whole other story because Alderney was evacuated, and what went on in Alderney, even to this day, is still pretty dark and bleak. I mean, we, we understand it was probably one of the uh, last internment camps or even concentration camps on, on British soil, so that's a, another story for another day. So there was no... Alderney was evacuated. There was nobody there other than the occupying forces and this concentration camp. Guernsey, Sark, uh, Herm and, and Jersey were occupied. But once Hitler lost interest or had his attention taken away to, to Moscow and, and to Russia, the supply chain dried up and people began to go hungry. Um, you know, there was only so much that you could provide on the islands themselves. They were cut off from the UK. They were cut off from mainland Europe. Of course, you know, France was already uh, the focus of the UK's attention and the allies, they were trying to come through with, with D-Day. And, and when D-Day came, the planes flew past and the boats went past Jersey and Guernsey and France was being liberated, but there was no chance that the Channel Islands were being liberated. And in the end, the, there were very few rations for the, um, the, the occupying soldiers and people were starving. And so it relied upon the Red Cross to send a ship uh, full of food parcels. A Canadian ship called the Vega came just before Christmas 1944. Uh, and quite frankly, if it hadn't come at that time, more people in these islands would have died from starvation and deprivation than were people, ever killed people during did, the You occupation. mean people did die from starvation? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, young children, uh, older people, uh, those who were unwell. Yes, and, and the German forces were starving too um, because they weren't being supplied. They'd been forgotten about. And this is where, you know, it's an uneasy balance, isn't it? Collaboration or, or coexistence. Where What would you do in those circumstances? Because a lot of the people who were the occupying force uh, 
you know, they, they were a long way from their families. They didn't want to be here. They were here doing what their masters were telling them to do. So I've seen and, some of the some movies I've seen um, emphasize that, in fact, the Germans gave up their rations for the islanders. But is that true? Yes, it is. There, there are many tales and many stories of uh, those Germans who did have some, you know, some small amount of food or perhaps sweets remaining, sharing them. And there was that dilemma, wasn't it, for the, for the children? Do they take the, the sweets from the German officer or, or do they go hungry? And, and I think, you know, there's that uneasy balance. But there were, you know, friendships struck. Of course there were. If you're living cheek by jowl in a small island, you are going to make relationships and, and friendships. And obviously there were girls who formed liaisons with the, the German soldiers and so on. And, and there were others who were just pragmatic about it, as well as that we've touched on it, those who certainly during the middle years of the occupation would have collaborated. So after the war, when the, when the British arrived, were they judgmental about what was going on in Jersey or did they understand? I don't think, I don't think they actually thought a great deal about it. I think on the 9th of May, 1945, when those two uh, British uh, uh, Navy ships arrived in each of the islands, in Guernsey and in, in Jersey, it was just a sense that freedom had come, that the, it was the end. Already things were beginning to fall apart. Uh, the, the, the German con commanders in each island had already pulled back their troops to their barracks. They were already, you know, the Union flags were beginning to fly again on, on, on buildings in, in both islands. It, it was a, a peaceful end to the occupation, as it could possibly be, really. And the um, surrender was signed on board each of the ships in the bay. And then British soldiers came ashore uh, and, you know, threw sweets to the crowds, gave them oranges. Um, they hadn't seen oranges for four or five years and so on. And people still remember that. And each year on May the 9th, we reenact that moment in the main square in St. Helier as a, an act of commemoration and, and uh, remembrance as well. The people in the, the islanders who'd gone to Britain, they'd escaped basically the, the trials and tribulations. How were they treated when they came back? Well, they were called the evacuees, and there were a relatively small number of about 60,000, about 5,000 people uh, went to the UK. Ironically, a lot of them went to Yorkshire. And there is a strong affiliation and association with various parts of Yorkshire now and the Channel Islands. They went to live in people's homes. And they, you know, they came back. But of course, they came back. Their homes had been taken over by by neighbours, by people who'd lost their own homes through bombing or through you know, them falling apart because they couldn't keep them repaired or because the Germans had commandeered them. So when they came back, nothing was here that they left, you know, and. <laughs> the irony is there are stories of some people saying, well, my best cyborg is now in my neighbor's house. They, you know, they purloined it. So they were having to start again. Some people decided not to come back. They decided that their lives were now in the UK. And there were some people who said, well, hang on a minute. We stuck it out for four and a half years. You went to the UK. We went through it all. You didn't. And there was an element of discomfiture there I think you know so it's taken a while and even to this day the evacuees it's taken a good 70 years for us really to recognize the sacrifices that were made by the evacuees they were perhaps the Excellent. forgotten part. Now in order to understand how this is a very complicated thing because you've got four islands they're all being occupied by the Germans to some a greater or lesser extent they're trying to exist without collaborating. The Germans are feeling a bit pissed off because they've been forgotten by Hitler. They're starving just the same as the people are starving. It's so complicated. And yet we get all our information from movies. But is there any movie that actually tells you exactly what was happening? Or is it just all Hollywoodized? I don't think there is any movie that tells you the exact story because it's so personal. I think, to be honest, you know, if you think there were 45,000 people here, then there are probably 45,000 different occupations because everybody had a different experience of it. You know, whether, you know, they were young children who had to go to school on alternate days because they could only manage one pair of shoes between them, or whether, you know, there, there were people who were riding their bike and they were using, um, you know, bits of whatever they could find as inner tubes to try to make those bikes go around. There was no clothing or, or the, you know, people hid radios underneath you know the floorboard so they could listen to the BBC to try to find out what was really going on. Everybody has an occupation story and everybody will tell you about so-and-so down the road who didn't quite toe the line 
I lived in a house in, in St. Helier for a while, and I discovered in visiting one of the um, museums here that the previous occupant had shocked their neighbour to the German commandant for storing coal, for stockpiling coal. You know, effectively they said, dear commandant, I'm writing to you from this house, but my neighbour next door is, is keeping supplies of coal that they shouldn't be doing. And then, of course, the Germans went round. So, you know, there's all sorts of motivation. And I suspect there are people to this day who says we can't speak to such and such a family because their aunt shopped my granny to the authorities and for stealing a loaf of bread or, or for hiding a, a pig when they came to check how many, you know, pieces of livestock you had available on your, your small holding. OK, so so all this is quite understandable. But there is a really dark side to this, isn't it? I'm, I hadn't heard the story about Alderney before, but the dark side of it when I was there was visiting that hospital, the, the underground hospital, and realizing how many, uh, how much slave labor had been imported into Jersey and how many of those people had died miserable deaths. Uh, how does that fit into the, everybody's psyche? Well, this is the bit that's not told in any of the films, isn't it? And I think the other thing that we tend to forget is that those films tend to make these, these places look wonderful. But to this day, you know, 77 years on to, from liberation, so, you know, over 80 years since occupation, you know, the, the, the Atlantic Wall that was built by Germany wasn't built by Germans, it was built by Russian slave workers, Ukrainian slave workers, Italian fascists who'd fallen out of favour, Jewish people, uh, people uh, who were members of Freemasons. All of these groups that were subjugated by the Nazis were, were shipped here and they were made to work and they were in forced labour camps. There's nothing nice about that. They were fed minimum rations. They were kept apart from their families. They lived pretty miserable lives and they were working night and day, back-breaking work, building great concrete fortifications, gun emplacements, and this underground hospital. This hospital was never used in anger, but the occupying Nazi forces, they cut it into the side of the hill and they reinforced it. And literally, as people dropped, you know, people died building this. They were moved out of the way and the next one came in. And you go in there and there's this eerie silence. You've experienced it. There's a oh, silence. Terrible and a chill and no words can encapsulate that as you feel you go in there nobody ever was on an operating table in there nobody ever was in a ward in there but people died cutting this hospital into the hillside yeah i think there's, the word awesome is, is is used for all sorts of things but the silence in that place is just awful I mean, it is, it is truly awful. Now, that's open now, and you can go and see it, can't you, as a, as, a, as, a, as a tourist. It's a bit of a gruesome thing to do, but isn't it good to remind yourself of how awful people can be? We don't need to read the news. 70 years ago, they were doing this exact same thing. Well, this is what struck uh, so many islanders, and it's resonating with us. I know we all uh, look on as to what's happening in Ukraine with absolute horror, but people here say... You know, this is an island and this island and the other islands are reaching out to Ukraine in every possible way because they know what it's like to have their liberty taken away from them. They know what it's like to have their rights to self-determination, to, to read the papers that they want to read, to read the books they want to read, to speak the language that they want to speak forbidden to them. And that's very powerful. And you go into that, that hospital, which is now a museum, and it's not gaudy or tasteless anyway. It tells quite chillingly clearly the story of occupation something that we just skirted on in this this conversation today but it does say people died this was a horrible period of history and whilst there were glimmers of humanity it was a dark dark time and people really did plumb the depths quite interesting that you started this whole conversation by saying that uh, it still resonates to this day uh, now, how do you how do you handle it on the radio station? Do you you commemorate it? You you remember it? What do you do? We're very careful with the language with it, that we use um, because, again, there are people who still um, were here because they, you know they're in their eighties and nineties now, but they do remember the occupation. There are those who are the children of those evacuees or the children of those who who lived through the occupation. Uh, my wife's grandmother uh, lived until fairly recently and, and would talk of her experiences firsthand 
of of the occupation and, and listening covertly to the radio of the problems they had finding food but also the coexistence of having to live alongside these occupiers but also many people would would give food to the um, the, the slave workers and we even to this day we're hearing news stories of people who hid slave workers or or gave them refuge. Um, and some of these slave workers we've been hearing were, were from the Ukrainian ascendancy and, and so on. It's, it's really interesting to hear how common humanity, even though they put themselves at risk, did reach out to try to feed people, to give them shelter. And, and those who, I know there were several well-documented cases of people who, who hid uh, slave workers who escaped from, you know, the um, camps in which they were being forced to live and then lived undercover for 18 months to two years. Remarkable, remarkable stories. Uh, and you just think, would I ever be able to do that if I were in that position? <laughs>